Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's webinar. Uh, my name is Mike Geringer. I'm the Director of Research and Evaluation at Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. And I am joined today by Michelle Kaufman, uh, my esteemed colleague, and we'll be talking about some cool new research studies that we've done over the last couple of years. I do have a slide deck to uh, share with you here, so give me a second to share my screen. I will pull that up and we will get started. Okay, great. Cathedral, those slides look good? Yep, they look good. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate uh, you all taking some time out of your day on a, a Monday morning, or I guess it's afternoon on the East Coast, uh, the lunch hour. So thanks for uh, joining us with the sandwich or whatever you're having for lunch today. Uh, I am actually on the West Coast, so it's still morning for me. Uh, but appreciate everyone taking a little bit of time to learn about uh, some cool new e-mentoring studies uh, that Michelle and I have been working on for the last uh, couple of years. So, uh, as I already said, uh, Mike Geringer, Director of Research and Evaluation at Mentor. I'm joined today by my colleague, Michelle Kaufman, who's an Associate Professor in the uh, Department of Health, Behavior, and Society at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, welcome, Michelle. I'm also joined by my colleague, uh, Kathija, at our Boston office at our, our headquarters at Mentor. Uh, she'll be handling uh, some of the technology today and helping out with uh, Q&A uh, throughout this session. So welcome, everybody. So here's what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. Uh, we'll be talking about kind of uh, you know, the promise and potential of e-mentoring, both before uh, COVID hit, uh, but then certainly uh, talking a lot about the experiences that folks had uh, trying to switch to e-mentoring during the pandemic and how that went and what we have learned from those attempts to switch. Uh, that will mostly come in the form of kind of a review of three major studies that Michelle has been leading over the last few years. And that's resulted in some tools that we think will help programs assess uh, their capacity to deliver e-mentoring effectively, right? So sometimes there's a desire to to do a new type of programming or shift your service delivery in a different direction, uh, but are you ready for that? I think a lot of programs spent the last two years learning some hard lessons <laughs> about capacity uh, to do e-mentoring well. So we'll talk about what we've learned around that. We're hoping to save about five to 10 minutes at the end of this presentation for Q&A. So uh, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and throw those into uh, the chat, uh, and uh, we'll get to those as we go along. I think we'll also uh, pause as we talk about the studies to see if folks have specific questions about those. Uh, just because folks always ask, uh, we will be recording this. We are recording today's uh, session, and uh, we'll be making it available on Mentor's uh, website after the event. Uh, we've also got a couple of tools and handouts that are not quite ready, so we won't be sharing those today, but they will be ready in uh, May, and we'll be emailing those out to everyone who registered for this webinar uh, as soon as they're publicly available. So go ahead and ask questions uh, however you need to ask them in the chat. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we'll be sending out uh, all these materials when we're done. So no need to take furious notes uh, or screen captures of slides as we go. We'll make those available to you. So I wanted to start us off here before we get into the studies that Michelle led, really just thinking about e-mentoring kind of broadly and where we were at with it prior to the pandemic uh, hitting in 2020. And so, you know, in the before times, uh, I think of pre-COVID as, you know, the before times a little bit, maybe sounds like we're talking about, you know, Lord of the Rings, uh, Middle Earth or something, but uh, it does feel like a sea change happened right over the last two years uh, and things have been very different and uh, maybe that's starting to wane, hopefully that's starting to wane, but I think if we think back to then, you know, prior to the pandemic, uh, I think e-mentoring was really growing in popularity. There was kind of buzz around e-mentoring uh, for a bunch of reasons. And I think the main one is that our technology keeps improving significantly around uh, mobile devices. You know, everyone's got one of these things in their pocket now, and it's, uh, you know, a heck of a, a powerful computer to be fitting in a pocket. Um, certainly advances in 4 and 5G cell service and things like Wi-Fi. 
um, compression algorithms that make streaming video like we're doing right now uh, possible and fairly affordable and cheap. Um, and just really advances in, in hardware, video conferencing, all of this, you know, where it's kind of some leaps made. It feels like we've had cell phones and things like that for forever, but it's really only been, you know, a decade or so that these have become really ubiquitous. And so I think that opened up a world of possibility around using technology and mentoring that was just simply not feasible, not affordable, and not widely accessible to young people um, prior to maybe the last, you know, decade or, or less. Um, and so last time Mentor did a big national study of uh, mentoring programs, we found that only about 3% of the youth in mentoring programs around the country uh, were being served uh, through e-mentoring technologies, right? That may have been a little low. There's probably more texting and things like that happening that may have been captured there. But we asked programs kind of, what's your delivery model? You know, it was really a small percentage that said we do e-mentoring as our primary form of service delivery. But I think that was changing, right? And I think folks were not only looking at it as a primary way to deliver mentoring, but also really as a, a way of supplementing in-person meetings, right? As a way of expanding the availability of mentors at uh, different times of day, you know, and not really reliant on coming together in some geographic location to be together with their mentee. And so uh, I think there's tremendous potential as a supplement to in-person with e-mentoring as well. And, you know, it's really good because we know from prior research that there is a lot of promise and a lot of success that's had, been had with e-mentoring uh, over the years. So if we look at the research on kind of virtual mentoring uh, broadly, you know, there's really a wide uh, variety of domains that are impacted by that, right? So you see a lot of it in the career planning, career exploration space, certainly uh, use in classrooms. There's many programs that bring professionals into uh, K-12 classrooms via technology like that to work on projects together. Um, mental and physical health, Michelle, I know a lot of your work is in this space using technology to reach people um, dealing with, you know, kind of difficult circumstances related to their health. Um, and then really, I think, you know, it can be useful in building a sense of belonging and identity, particularly for young people that are isolated uh, for various reasons, right? And so uh, young people facing chronic illness, rural youth, um, youth underrepresented on various pathways. So you see a lot of e-mentoring that's had success uh, getting, say, girls or uh, minority youth interested in certain careers where they are underrepresented, uh, youth with disabilities. There's a lot of work around that, around getting them on career paths um, and into particular fields. Um, youth with kind of stigmatized identities, so LGBTQ youth, immigrant and refugee youth. Um, you know, Michelle, some of your work is dealing with uh, young adults with HIV, uh, reaching them via technology. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of a more frequent and flexible connection point for in-person matches. And so prior to the pandemic hitting, like we knew that this had a lot of promise and potential uh, when done well. But then uh, this guy hit with its stupid spike proteins and all the misery that it caused uh, for many years. Uh, and it changed things. I think very quickly, Programs were thrust into kind of chaos mode was the word that I heard uh, to describe it for many practitioners, right? Schools are closed, program facilities were closed, community activities were non-existent for many uh, months at a time. Uh, many staff reported things like their funding, you know, was challenged, uh, staff left, uh, either because of the funding thing or just dealing with COVID in their own uh, life made them unable to continue with the program. Uh, I heard anecdotally a lot about losing mentors and youth as their families dealt with the fallout of it. Um, then as we got into kind of the, you know, 2020, 21 school year, you know, things started to get back a little bit to normal. Um, you know, uh, there was some remote learning uh, largely across the country, still social distanced. Um, and really just the story I heard from practitioners was just, we've lost the momentum of our program. Uh, we really, you know, are struggling to kind of keep the ball rolling here uh, because, you know, schools would reopen and then close. And so the shifting circumstances of the situation 
uh, obvious or just very difficult for folks. Um, so a lot of practitioners in our field turn to e-mentoring, right? We don't want to just tell matches, go home, you're done, uh, because they can't meet in person, right? So everyone tried to find, figure out on the fly, how is this going to work best, right? So that only not only involved picking the right technology and hoping that it was you know, something folks had comfort with and could use and could access, but you know, rethinking program activities, even rethinking the theory of change of the program, right? You may have been focused on X before the pandemic, but now maybe your mentors are providing more emotional support. Maybe they're providing uh, other things that are helping youth and families respond to the crisis, right? So it really just changed the dynamic of everything about folks' programs um, and really left folks considering, you know, what are our infrastructure needs, right? And, and you often have really good physical spaces and really cool activity guides, but um, how are we going to do that when no one can come together in a space and work on something or use a piece of equipment together, uh, those types of things really uh, forced a lot of change. Um, I think I have heard great stories of success uh, and certainly the studies that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Plenty of folks said, yeah, we really built a new capacity and this worked pretty well. Uh, others told a different story. It did not work as well. Um, and so we're left with a field that is still trying to figure out if we're going to offer virtual mentoring via different technologies, you know, what does that need to look like? What are good solutions that are going to fit our program, our kids, our mentors? Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, because Michelle really had a great vision for some studies that I think unpack not only what programs went through during the pandemic, but what they learned about their ability to do this moving forward. So hopefully we are emerging from uh, a couple of years of pandemic. Um, but I think, you know, the task now is to learn from that and build on what we know about e-mentoring so that everyone can kind of integrate this into their services more effectively as we move forward. So with that, uh, I'm going to tee up Michelle here, our great partners at Johns Hopkins, uh, started this series of studies to see what we could maybe learn and carry forward. I do want to give a big thanks to our funder on this work, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you very much for your generous support here. I also want to thank our program partners. And as one of the studies that you'll hear about today involved um, working with our partners at I Could Be, uh, which is a really fantastic uh, e-mentoring offering. Uh, it's been around for a long time as one of the kind of more robust platforms I've ever seen around e-mentoring. Uh, and we're really great partners in one of our studies, letting us do some secondary analysis on data that they had collected about their program. So I want to give them a big thanks for being amazing partners in all of that as well. Um, and so over the last 18 months, we've done these three studies uh, and really tried to look at the capacity of mentoring programs and what we learned about what things you can do moving forward that will promote success of your e-mentoring work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, and she's going to walk us through her these three studies. So take it away, Michelle. Thank you, Mike. And thank you to all of you attending today. Um, before I get started, I did just want to acknowledge my team uh, because there were several people involved who helped to make these three studies possible over the last couple of years. Kate Wright, uh, Deb Levine, Guyan Yanokian, Shobin Zhao, Maritza Salcido, and Chelsea Almendra. Um, so I'm very, very briefly gonna go over each of these three studies and give an overview of our key findings. Um, and there will be a, a short report and eventually some academic articles associated with each of these studies. Mike will go over that in more detail towards the end. Um, but let me talk about our first study, which was looking at focus groups with program staff um, who tried to switch to e-mentoring during the early parts of the pandemic. So we ended up conducting seven focus groups with 20 different mentoring organizations represented. Um, these were a majority of were from smaller organizations, and we see this later when I talk about a survey that we did as well, a lot of these organizations were functioning with fewer than five staff members, which um, created some challenges uh, when, it, when it came to doing that quick switch to e-mentoring as a result of the pandemic. 
these focus groups did take place in April of 2021. So it was just about a year after um, you know, the stay at home orders were put in place in, in a lot of states around the country. Next slide. So we ended up asking these focus group uh, participants a number of questions about how the transition to e-mentoring went. What were the challenges they faced? What sort of things helped them with that transition? Um, what would they do differently if they had to do it over again? Um, and one of the key findings that we found was that um, these considerations of e-mentoring were hampered by other pandemic related circumstances naturally, right? We saw reduced staffing and for some organizations, um, reduced budgets all of a sudden. Uh, as Mike mentioned, mentors, families of the youth, uh, even staff themselves were dealing with their own personal circumstances related to the pandemic. And um, uh, the programs that we included in this study estimated around a 20% loss of matches early in the pandemic for a variety of these reasons. Next slide. When we asked about what made the switch to e-mentoring successful for these programs, one thing that came up quite often was that familiar technology seemed to work well. So a lot of us quickly learned how to function on Zoom, um, but for others, we were already using text messaging, FaceTime, social media in our everyday lives. And so the mentoring programs that made a quick switch to e-mentoring using these technologies that mentors and youth and their families were already familiar with seemed to fare better. Um, programs that also were able to very quickly be creative about finding online activities tended to do better. Um, you know, these have included a number of things that we've heard about throughout the pandemic, virtual classes, uh, movie watch parties, et cetera. Um, and matches with a history of communicating through technology before the pandemic naturally tended to fare better. So some programs, uh, traditionally mentoring is um, done face-to-face, -face, you know, through these collective activities between mentors and youth. Um, but those who had already allowed some sort of interactive communication using technology for their matches prior to the pandemic um, tended to make this transition to entirely virtual much easier. Next slide. Obviously there were many challenges. One that we've heard a lot um, in the news and you know, if you're following education outcomes is screen fatigue for youth, um, especially in that first school year um, during the pandemic. Uh, we did see a lot of, uh, uh, several programs did mention that technology access continued to be an issue, you know, even a year after the pandemic for some uh, less resource settings that technology just still wasn't there. Um, young people were having to share devices or didn't have regular access to Wi-Fi. And so obviously this not only had implications for their education, but also for their mentoring relationships. Uh, programs also shared that when they had limited staff to support uh, the technological components, this limited their ability to manage online program delivery. Um, and a lot of programs also had limited tech support and some talked about either um, working with vendors temporarily or even having volunteers to step in. Um, I remember hearing in one focus group, a program talking about how they would ask neighbors to come and help them with the technological aspects of it, um, just because a lot of the staff on mentoring programs are not um, as tech savvy as, as would be required for a full e-mentoring program. Next slide. So we did ask these uh, focus group participants for what advice they have for those programs who are thinking about transitioning to e-mentoring. And one thing they said was to start small and sort of build your capacity slowly. They felt that the quick shift to e-mentoring is, is not something that is recommended. You know, you really need to sort of take small steps to to make that shift. And there's there tends to be a large investment in the beginning to learn how to do so well. But that effort is is worth it. 
Um, also make sure e-mentoring is accessible. Uh, the participants described challenges with um, people who are not using English as a first language, um, program participants with disabilities that might have implications when using technology, and as I mentioned, limited technology access at home. So being sure to consider all of these challenges for the stakeholders in your program is vital. And then finally, emphasizing dedicated staffing support. You know, maybe hiring one staff person who's devoted to the e-mentoring aspect of the program. For a lot of these uh, smaller programs, you know, having an IT department is not uh, financially feasible, but being sure that you have someone on staff who is very familiar with the technology and can sort of serve as tech support in the interim um, is more likely to, to help with the success of the program. Next slide. All right, so let me quickly turn to study two. Um, and this came out of a, our focus group study, but was also related to um, a couple of organizations that have been studying digital readiness, as they call it, of um, civil society organizations. Next slide. So we designed a survey based on these tools from the organizations N10 and Hope Lab, um, where they are uh, providing a tool for organizations to do a self-assessment of their own digital readiness before taking on a large technology integration project. So we adapted those tools for use in the mentoring sector. Um, and what we hope to do with our study was to, first of all, describe what the readiness of the mentoring field is in terms of taking on e-mentoring and also try to validate this tool for broader use within the field. So we ended up sending a call for survey participants um, and received responses from about 95 organizations. And we analyzed um, 88 of those survey responses for programs who had no e-mentoring experience prior to the pandemic. Next slide. So these are just some uh, brief tables to show you what the program, who the programs were that were participating in the survey. They tended to be on the small side, have um, fewer than five staff again, um, average of less than 100 youth per program. Um, a majority of them were only in person, doing in person activities until the pandemic hit. And only about a quarter of them ha actually had someone who was in charge of the technology for the program. Next slide. So, in our survey, in addition to asking about program uh, characteristics, we looked at um, a number of items that assess the program's e-mentoring capacity and e-mentoring readiness. And um, we, we did what's called a confirmatory factor analysis. And you know, in statistical terms, that means we are looking at the collection of questions on these surveys and seeing which questions sort of hang together for most participants to reveal um, you know, sort of underlying concepts. And so when we did all of these fancy statistical analyses, we found that that e-mentoring capacity and e-mentoring readiness were the two factors that were most important. Next slide. So e-mentoring capacity of the organization really speaks to, do you have the proper equipment to run an e-mentoring program? Do you have staff who can support that sort of program? Do you have participant buy-in? You know, and this includes mentors, mentees, their families, and even the staff, right? Is, is everyone on board with the fact that we are going to take on this e-mentoring program? And then do you have, as an organization, do you have the right activities that are gonna be used in e-mentoring? You know, one common misconception, I think early in the pandemic was that, well, you could take a lot of the in-person activities that you are already doing and just do it in front of a screen. And we now know that a lot of the um, interaction through video, digital communication does have to be adapted somewhat in order to um, continue to build a strong relationship between a mentor and a mentee. The e-mentoring readiness factor was more focused on 
questions that asked whether participants are comfortable with the technology, um, whether they want to try out the experience of mentoring, e-mentoring, you know, do they have positive attitudes towards that? I've heard from a number of programs throughout the, the pandemic and beyond that um, in order to do an e-mentoring program, they often have to convince particularly families that e-mentoring, it can be um, just as fun and just as rewarding for their their young person as say more of a traditional in-person uh, form of mentoring. And so e-mentoring readiness, the organization might be ready to take this on, but if the families, the youth are not looking for that type of mode, then that could obviously cause a barrier. Next slide. So in terms of statistical analysis, statistical standards, um, we did show that this factor analysis did not produce what's typically known as a good model fit, although it was close, right? And so one thing we are asking is that, um, you know, when we release the full version of this tool uh, it, next month, that if you and your organization are going to be answering this survey, that you send us those results, because that'll help us to increase, increase the sample size and continue to refine the tool and make it um, strong in terms of psychometric properties. So that's a lot of um, statistical speak, but I will say that um, given the fairly small sample size that we tested this tool with, we are headed in a direction that this tool is, is a strong, valid one. Next slide. So let me talk about the final study, um, which was actually an analysis of data that the I Could Be program graciously provided to us. Next slide. These data were, um, well, let me start by saying I could be, um, as Mike mentioned, is a leader in the e-mentoring space and they offer participants a really robust e-mentoring platform for use in school-based programs. Um, they focus on college and career readiness and building of social capital through their mentoring activities. Um, and I could be, while it's e-mentoring does happen within the classroom setting with a teacher um, helping to facilitate those e-mentoring relationships. Um, but for this secondary analysis, we wanted to look at what sort of factors or variables enhance the success of e-mentoring e for programs like I could be. Um, and so we chose their pre-pandemic data so that we could um, have a better sense of what happened, you know, not in a crisis setting. Next slide. So these data were from 2019 to 2020 school year. Um, you can see the numbers there for the, the scope of the data. Um, since 2020, that school year was cut a little short. We didn't have all of the youth post-program surveys, but we were able to do uh, a robust analysis based on, on the survey responses we did have. We also had a slew of engagement metrics from their e-mentoring platform that, that we were able to look at. Next slide. So we did a number of analyses where we looked at the confidence levels of the mentees or the students that participated in this program and their self-efficacy around uh, post high school plans. Um, we also looked at the size of the youth network so as they move through the I Could Be program and they complete um, quests, that is what the program refers to it as, they add more mentors, more adults that they could reach out to um, in their network. And so we were able to show through this analysis that as the size of the youth network increased, so did their confidence and self-efficacy around having good plans for uh, what they were gonna do after high school. These gains um, in their confidence and self-efficacy were also related to how um, long they engaged in the program, you know, if, in terms of when they first started to log into the platform until the end, the number of days that they logged in, their total number of minutes spent in the system, and even the word count on their posts you know, that went back and forth between mentors and mentees. And so this was a really interesting way for us to look at all of these 
big data, as they're called, uh, in e-mentoring platforms to show that a lot of these engagement markers were predictors of the, uh, growth and confidence and self-efficacy for these young people. Next slide. We were also able to show that youth understood the value of mentors and their knowledge of the program at, at baseline. So before they actually started the program, predicted their engagement over the year. And so this suggests that if you properly prepare youth for the mentoring experience, particularly when it comes to e-mentoring, because this is so new to, to a lot of people, that that can set them up for having realistic expectations around what the e-mentoring relationship is going to look like. And then that is an important precursor for their engagement and participation in an e-mentoring program like I could be. There have been a couple of other studies of I could be um, several years ago, and they produced some similar findings around self-efficacy. That was the variable that was looked at previously. Um, but what we were able to show through this secondary analysis is that e-mentoring services like this may be a meaningful way of helping students to build confidence and really think about their post high school plans. And that if a program such as IQB builds real world social capital and stronger networks, that could help young people to have more confidence as they transition out of high school. Next slide. So I think we're going to pause there. I'm sorry, Mike, I meant to pause between each study and it completely slipped up my mind. So let me pause there and see if there are any um, questions related to the these three studies. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. There was one that came in uh, just a minute ago asking, um, in addition to word count by message, was anything else examined about the messages themselves? If the messages were short but frequent and substantive, for example, uh, did that look differently than uh, than pairs that sent longer messages but may have been less light on content? You know, so was there any? We didn't, I don't think, looked at that. Uh, we wanted to, but I think that uh, we didn't <laughs> in the end. So yeah, that. That part of it got cut from, from this, this portfolio of work. But I will say that's something that I continue to be interested in is looking at the content of text interactions between mentors and mentees and in e-mentoring. Um, and I work with a team of computer scientists and we're talking about ways that we could uh, get funding to do this, but you essentially have to use natural language processing because of the size of the data that is available. Um, but we want to look at, are there certain sentiments within these mentor-mentee inter text interactions that are then predictive of a strong mentoring relationship and better outcomes? Um, so I think that's sort of the next phase in further understanding the impact of e-mentoring. I think I'll just piggyback on that and say there is other research that has looked at kind of, um, you know, the frequency and content of messages, I, I, little getting in, I guess, into the content, but I think what we were able to show here is consistent with other research where it really is kind of, you have to be frequently engaging in order to get much out of e-mentoring, and I know that a lot of programs spend considerable time sending prompts to participants. Now that can backfire sometimes where they feel like you're nagging them to interact, right? Or uh, there are other challenges that can come up if you're you know, prompting too much. But I really think this is like a momentum thing where because the volunteer is not coming to the school once a week or you're not setting plans to meet out in the community somewhere, at a regular interval, like it is a bit of an out of sight, out of mind thing, right? And so I think at the very base level, frequency matters, you know, almost regardless of the, the quality of the content. Um, but certainly there have been other studies, Michelle, we've talked about this and other things we've written where, you know, mentors that are more comfortable communicating, um, you know, especially if it's text-based, you know, the use of emojis, uh, the use of open-ended questions, uh, you know, if you give a teenager a yes, no question, that's all you're going to get out of them, right? So there are some things that I think we know from other studies about the quality of those messages. But 
um, even response times, right? So, oh, you took too long to write me back. And, and so I think some of that is also setting expectations with the participants up front around, you know, hey, if you message me in the middle of the day, I may not be able to respond uh, right away, you know, so don't take it as a slight if I take a few hours to get back to you. Um, uh, another question here is ICBE's program only related to messaging. Michelle, do you know all the, the features? I believe there's there's more than written communication there, correct? Um, I think the communication with the mentors is only written, although the mentees are assigned quests, and so they might have to do an activity, and then the mentor provides feedback on that. Um, but they they never meet the mentor through video or or anything like that. They don't know the true identity, I guess, of, of the mentor. It, it's all through text communication or feedback around their quest activities. Yeah. yeah, and I will say that that quest, you know, it's a kind of a curricular experience where the youth and the mentor kind of engage in these activities, all of which are designed to help that young person build uh, their network and their social capital and the, the resources they have in, in kind of real life to help them uh, with these transitions uh, out of that. And so, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought we did find a correlation between number of quests completed and the size, the growth of those young people's networks. So, um, yeah, so yeah, that right. suggests that having, you know, some activities to do, they, it wasn't rigid though. It wasn't like by week four, you have to be done with quest four or you're in trouble with the program. They can kind of skip around a little self -paced. bit. Yeah, and self-paced, yeah. So um, did the study show, we'll do one last question in here and then we'll move on to some kind of global themes and preview the tools that Michelle and I have, have mentioned here. Uh, do we find any negative impacts for students um, in the outcome data? For the secondary analysis, I assume they're talking about yeah. here, um, we did not find any negative impacts. Um, there were some instances where we didn't see any sort of improvement, um, uh, particularly for, I think there were some where it was like some subgroups of, of youth, we didn't see improvement, um, but that no, no harm done. No, we didn't, yeah. we didn't pick up, pick up on that. Yeah, definitely. And we did have another question about um, what apps and seem to be most effective in some of this. That's kind of a more global question. We'll get to that here at the end. I think some of that might get addressed in what we're about to cover here. So just some broad conclusions that I think Michelle and I felt came out of these three studies, if you look at them kind of as a whole. Uh, one is that, and you know, maybe this is a, a you know, no kidding, uh, finding, but I think switching to e-mentoring in the middle of a global crisis is probably not the ideal time uh, to be making that change, but we all did what we had to do as a field to be responsive to the needs of our, our youth and, and families and mentors, right? And so I was very heartened by the response from this field that I think treated that moment, <coughs> excuse me, as the true crisis that it was, that we have to be there uh, for our program participants. So on one hand, that's, you know, kudos to the mentoring field, but it did mean folks learned some harsh lessons about what it's like to try and reinvent yourself on the fly without much of a, you know, kind of runway for that and kind of deliberate planning. So um, that is one global conclusion that I think we, we know for sure. But I think <clears throat> I want to go back to one of those findings from the I could be study, which is and so I think it cuts across all of these, which was the programs where technology had been used a little bit before, even on a case by case map, you know, individual match level, um, having those expectations for what this is going to be like to communicate in this way. So brand new matches that started during the pandemic using e-mentoring or existing matches that had already been doing some uh, technology integration they did pretty well with this, right? It was really matches that had never communicated in this way, that had, you know, forced a switch from being together to being together but apart, right? That was really tough for folks. And so um, setting those expectations around what e-mentoring is going to be like, um, building enthusiasm 
about it. And I think especially for young people, right? I think us adults now, it's been two years of Zoom meetings and other, you know, kind of remote work things, right? But I think, and this is true of all mentoring programs, right? How are we preparing young people for this experience? And do they understand the value of this mentor that's going to be engaging them? Um, you know, you can build that rapport when a volunteer is sitting in front of you at school every week. But if they're just, you know, a blinking cursor on a screen, I think that becomes a lot harder unless the program is doing some serious preparation and helping you as a student or a young person see the value in this, right? What am I going to get out of this? How is it going to function? Uh, those young people participated in I could be a heck of a lot more than young people that kind of were iffy about those things going into it. Um, and Michelle, you'd already talked about uh, getting families on board with this. A lot of times, you know, mentors uh, are viewed by parents as a real, you know, key asset and someone that they want to bring into their child's life. And it can seem a little watered down if it's just, you know, a talking face on a Zoom call, right? And so getting them to understand that, no, we can still have a big impact on your child and, and help with all the things they need help with. We're just going to do it through this technology instead of in person, or maybe moving forward, I think a lot of our focus group participants said a hybrid model is certainly going to be, uh, you know, something they want to explore and build permanently, um, especially for school-based programs, right? Like there should be no more snow days anymore, right? Everyone can log in and still do uh, program activities uh, remotely, unless they're out sledding on a snow day. Um, I think the other thing, and we've talked about this quite a bit, is just e-mentoring requires good infrastructure. And I think programs fell into one of two camps. They either focused a lot on the technology and the hardware and the internet access and who can get online, or they focused on uh, kind of, are people up for this, right? They focused on the people side of it, but it really takes both, right? And so uh, good technology decisions, getting your staff on board. I heard from so many programs where they were like, yeah, it's the staff that is kind of not sure how this is gonna work and not really bought in. Um, and they may need professional development to manage this well. And then, you know, I think an underrated piece of this that came out um, in a couple of the studies was the shift to doing your activities virtual. There are a lot of programs that are built around hands-on things, right? So STEM programs where you're, doing science experiments or, you know, career focused things where you're teaching young people how to use equipment and, you know, be in a workplace. Uh, all of that was hard to do virtually, right? So what parts of that can be done online? Uh, and, you know, I heard of many STEM programs that would send the materials to young people's houses and mentors houses so that they could, you know, build the baking soda volcano or do the egg drop thing, you know, at home. Uh, so there are times when you just need physical materials to do activities, right? So really thinking through, based on your theory of change, how do we need to deliver these activities and what parts of it really can't be done virtually, right? And what does that mean for your program's outcomes? And I think the last note that I saw, and it was one of the things that I think programs felt best about in uh, the focus groups and in that survey was you know, they got to have some fun here and they got to be really creative in solving that issue of like, what activities are we gonna do and how are we gonna do them? Um, there were many one-to-one -one programs that I think shifted to group meetings uh, just for ease of uh, technology, but also I think creating community in a way that was missing because people couldn't come together in the, the program. But Certainly all of these fun activities, Michelle, we've heard so many examples of, you know, scavenger hunts and geocaching and Netflix watch parties and cooking classes where everyone's, you know, trying to bake the same cake at home in real time. Um, you know, it was, I think it was heartening to see that creative side. I think staff really liked having that opportunity to, to reinvent that on the fly. I think in the case of I could be what I was impressed with, and it's just baked into their model as, as what it is, is they're very intentional about like, even though this is a virtual relationship, we're not really meeting, you know, except in cyberspace, <laughs> um, but 
the activities are designed to help young people build, you know, their networks of support in real life, right? So even though it's a virtual mentoring experience, what the young person has to do to grow and learn and build that support all takes place off screen, right? And so I think really thinking about how you can take e-mentoring and use that to uh, do real life stuff, right? Not that e-mentoring isn't real life, but you know what I mean, right? It, it's not a virtual experience. It's still about what's happening to you in your community, in your home, in your school. Um, and so thinking carefully about that piece of it. So I do wanna cover real quick uh, the tools uh, that we will be making available in May. Uh, we should have these out mid month, I would guess. Um, and we'll email them directly to everyone who registered for this event. So don't worry about having to stop by the mentor website and, and download them. We'll make sure you get them directly. But uh, Michelle, I'll let you talk about the first one uh, that came out of that second study we did. Yeah, so this was the scale that was included in our survey. Um, with data collected from programs nationally. And so there are two parts to this, uh, e-mentoring capacity and e-mentoring readiness, as I mentioned. And so these are just a couple of example items from each of these parts of the scale. So for capacity, covering things like how comfortable is your program staff with the technology needed for e-mentoring, how comfortable are the mentees with the technology that you've cho chosen, and then readiness focuses more on items such as how comfortable do you think mentors are with having sensitive conversations with youth via technology? How comfortable are the youth families um, when it comes to an adult child mentoring relationship online? Um, so two slightly different aspects of the e-mentoring experience, but uh, both vitally important. So Mike, I think you already covered this. We'll send this out to folks on this call next month. Um, and as I said, if you end up using this tool with your program, share, share your results with the mentoring team so that we can continue to improve and refine this measure. And to answer your question, uh, Tony, yeah, we'll be emailing these out to folks so that they, um, so that they have a copy of uh, both of the tools we're talking about here. Um, if you want to, you know, print it out and uh, share it with your mentoring coordinators, you know, be our guest. What you do with the PDF is is up to you. Um, and Michelle, I'm assuming we'll also include some instructions for folks that do want to send their results back to us. Um, yeah. we'll, we can figure out a way to have that, you know, do that electronically um, so that you can uh, keep adding to the data set around this. Um, I saw we had one other question uh, in the, the chat here and Kathija, I know there's a few more in the Q&A uh, panel as well. We'll get to those in just a second. I also wanna talk about this other tool that we've developed and you know, it was actually something that existed prior to this, uh, the work of these three studies. It's something that Michelle and I came up with very quickly in I think March of 2020 when the pandemic hit and we realized everyone was going to be shifting online, we came up with a set of uh, kind of uh, questions to consider around planning of how are we gonna make this switch? Uh, what do we need to do to kind of get matches ready to do this all of a sudden? Uh, and that was used in a lot of technical assistance uh, by mentor and our affiliates around the country uh, through the National Mentoring Resource Center and, and other uh, projects. Uh, we then, in the wake of these studies and, and kind of wrapping this up, went back and, and shifted those questions a little bit to be less about how are you going to do this in crisis mode in the middle of this pandemic, but more kind of longer term uh, questions around thinking about e-mentoring, right? And so uh, these have not been tested psychometrically the way the other scale has, but I think these go a little bit deeper even than, than that scale in terms of getting into the nuance of you know, how you're going to do all these different pieces, right? How are you going to train mentors on using whatever tool or platform you've come up with, right? Um, how are you going to monitor those matches within that, right? It really gets into the weeds of, of you know, some nuances of this work. And they're all things that a staff would need to talk about and figure out 
and come up with solutions around. And so there's kind of five main categories of it. One is just the basic context of what is it we're trying to do and is this a permanent new form of delivery or is it supplementing in person? Uh, there's some questions around how this relates to your program model and theory of change and the setting that you're doing it in, how you'd answer some of these questions is gonna be different in a school versus a community center versus a faith institution or, or whatever it may be. Um, we then ask questions around the participant experience. How are you gonna get everyone ready to do this together uh, and maintain it over time? There's a section that deals with choosing the right technology, uh, which you might, might think that comes first, but I think you'll have an easier time picking the right tool once you've kind of thought through some of these logistical things and how you'd like it to work in an ideal way. And then lastly, uh, some questions around staff and resource capacity, right? Uh, the money piece is always <laughs> important here, right? This is not an area where you should probably try and do it on the cheap. Um, and so this tool will also be made available uh, in May. So we look forward to getting those out to you. So we do have uh, eight minutes here for some q and I thought I'd throw a little humor in here with a archival photo of an early, early e-mentoring uh, platform from the turn of the century. Uh, but certainly let's open it up here uh, for q and I saw that we had a, a long uh, question here from Philip kind of citing some prior research from Gene Rhodes and Sarah Schwartz, uh, you know, and they have, you know, did a study many years ago kind of showing that, you know, virtual communication added on to uh, in-person doesn't really detract from in-person. Uh, other studies, um, you know, talking about how, you know, in-person meetings tend to decline as relationships continue. Uh, but this can be a nice supplement to it. Um, and then really just, you know, did our study suggest anything in this regard? Um, I don't know if they did, Michelle, because I think most of what programs were doing here was almost, you know, purely supplementing, or not supplementing, I should say, purely switching to e-mentoring because they couldn't do in person at all, I think was the most common experience. So I don't think we really heard from anybody that was like, oh no, we just kept meeting in person through the pandemic, but also added <laughs> this e-mentoring capacity it was kind of one or the other. Um, but I think certainly coming out of that, I think a lot of programs felt like, well, now that we've done it, uh, we can now do it in a different way moving forward. Now that we're back in person, we know that we have this option that we didn't know or feel comfortable doing um, before. Uh, Michelle, is there anything you want to add around that? Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, it's been interesting to me to watch programs who added an e-mentoring component in addition to their traditional face-to-face e-mentoring programs. Um, for instance, I've been working with the organization Tuesday's Children, and they have really wanted to expand the reach of their mentoring and not be limited geographically. You know, they're working with children who have experienced a, a loss of a close family member due to um, various forms of violence. You know, they started with 9 11. Um, and so, in order to provide mentors to those children around the country, oftentimes the right mentor is not within their immediate community. And so they've created this e-mentoring program in addition to their face-to-face, -face, which is primarily based in New York. And so it'll be really interesting to me to see how the outcomes for the, the young people in each of those programs is either the same or different. You know, what are the nuances there, the in-person versus the e-mentoring? That's something that we have not been able to explore so far. And if there are other programs who have come out of this pandemic who've said, yeah, let's add an e-mentoring program like Tuesday's Children has, has done. Um, if you can compare your outcomes between those in-person relationships and the e-mentoring relationships, that would really add to the research in this field as to, you know, what, what are the differences? Where does it appear similar? Um, what types of youth seem to benefit more from e-mentoring versus in-person, et cetera. Um, so I look forward to, to hearing more from programs about that going forward. Yeah, that really is the big unanswered question. You might think at this stage, we have a good comparative study 
uh, where they you know, tried to do similar things, one in person, one online. And unfortunately, we just don't have that. I think in the years ahead, it's going to be critical to do that research um, and find the limits of e-mentoring as well as kind of, there might be plenty of things where it outpaces and outperforms in person uh, in a variety of ways. Um, Katija, anything come up in the Q&A panel that I have not been looking at as closely as you may have? Anything you want to elevate <laughs> um, from there? Yeah, there are two of them. Philip has been on point with all of his questions. Um, one of them is mentoring via the digital media has many advantages. It's less time consuming because there's not travel um, necessary to maintain contact. And then it's also costless. Um, and, it, and he also said that since interest driven relationships are more impactful and likely to be continued over longer periods of time and less likely to be interrupted because there is no geographical limitation, mentoring via digital media also permits the inception and continuance of mentoring relationships that are interest driven, which permits a wider selection of interests on which to base the relationship. Um, did focus group participants mention these issues? Um, so because we were conducting focus groups with programs that were sort of in crisis mode um, in, in doing this transition quickly, we didn't get into a lot of those issues. But what Philip brings up brings up is absolutely true. You know, it can be less time consuming, um, which I think is particularly important for mentors. Um, you know, it's often hard for programs to attract mentors because of the time commitment and the frequency. And so if a mentor can do a lot of these interactions, you know, from their computer during times that are convenient for them, especially if they have their own families, you might be able to attract a lot more mentors. Um, that's something that my, my personal research were trying to, to look at. Um, I will say though that e-mentoring does have a cost involvement, at least on the front end, if it's done well. Not so much in terms of the technology, if you're using technology that folks are already um, using on a daily basis, um, but in order to you know, do all the training properly and get everyone up to speed and their buy-in, and even to have tech support on your staff, there, is, there are cost implications to that. But once you sort of do that front-end investment, it does, I mean, we don't have cost effectiveness studies on this yet, but our, but our hunch is that e-mentoring can be less expensive than the in-person mentoring um, because it can virtually run itself at some point. Yeah. And I think that's true of programming that would be purely virtual, right? Where you don't need to yeah. be renting a facility uh, necessarily. I think if you're an existing in-person program that has, you know, physical infrastructure and, you know, rent in a building and, you know, all that um, and a phone system, you know, all the bells and whistles that come with running a, a business, then this is additional cost on top of it. I did hear some quotes from folks in uh, the focus groups talking about how they were surprised at how much more work it was to run it virtually because, instead of matches just meeting on their own and kind of scheduling them uh, themselves out in the community, it was now incumbent upon a staff member to schedule your Zoom meeting uh, in a secure platform that they felt comfortable with, right? And so there were some aspects of this that were more challenging. I can't bring all of my new mentors together in a room for an initial training. I have to do a, you know, a bunch of you know, separate Zoom meetings. Or So there were some parts of it that felt more uh, labor intensive. Um, so, uh, you know, and certainly all those prompts and discussion reminders uh, and stuff, um, you know, can take a lot of time. So those can be some costs. I will, to your point though, Philip, about interest driven, I think there's a long history of e-mentoring research around matches that have something in common, whether it's we share the same chronic illness or I'm a scientist in a certain field and you want to become a scientist in a certain field. Um, those matches always, I think, seem to have uh, the most success. And I think the e-mentoring I've seen that, you know, is most impactful is always geared around some common connection point. Um, doesn't mean that that relationship doesn't grow and become about other things, but 
Um, certainly that interest driven piece is good. Um, I know we are at time. Oh, oh I was just going to say there are two really quick like tech questions. Yep. Um, one of them is, was there any other app you can use besides iMessage and Zoom? And then the other one was, are there online agencies available to assist or advise in creating an e-mentoring program? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that second one last as a wrap up. Michelle, do you want to tackle that first one around apps? Yeah, so there, there are several e-mentoring specific apps available. I understand they, they can be quite expensive. I always say to programs, especially if you're small, to use technology that you're already using. There's nothing wrong with using you know, Google Meets or Zoom. Um, now, of course, you have to look at the age of your mentees, whether the families are comfortable with those platforms, the security around it. Um, you have to weigh all of those issues. and the one tool that we'll be sharing will help you to think through some of those things. Um, but there's no reason why you can't use technology that's already ex in existence to, to help with e-mentoring. Yeah, and then in terms of who's out there to help you with this, I would say uh, through our National Mentoring Resource Center project, uh, you can request free technical assistance through that project on really anything that your program wants to work on. But certainly over the last two years, We've got a lot of requests around help us, you know, switch to e-mentoring or figure out, you know, how to leverage technology. Michelle, I know you've done training for all of those TA providers, um, and that's a free resource, uh, your tax dollars at work, if you will. Uh, if you go to nationalmentoringresourcecenter.org, uh, there's a big red request help button, and there's a simple form you can fill out, and then we'll match you up with one of our uh, expert providers from around the country. So really, no matter where you're at in the US, you can get some help around that, um, have folks come to you and sit down with you and help you figure that out. So a good plug there for our NMRC project uh, at the end here. Uh, well, we are at time. I want to be respectful of everyone's uh, Monday uh, afternoon schedules. So thank you for joining us today. We'll be sending out the tools that we talked about here in the month of May. So look for those in your inbox. Appreciate you joining us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you all.